Thank you for downloading the IA podcast. You can listen to all our episodes on Podbean, Spotify, Apple, and YouTube. Enjoy. It has long been a commonly held assumption that young people sympathise with socialist ideas. We saw it in the 1960s with student radicals, and in recent years we have witnessed physical displays of left-wing activism on our streets. Young people have protested over austerity, students have shown solidarity towards striking teaching unions, and took to chanting Oh Jeremy Corbyn at Glastonbury Festival. Last week the Institute of Economic Affairs published a report with polling called Left Turn Ahead, which showed that the majority of young Brits are hostile to capitalism and hold positive views of socialist alternatives. The headline figure is that 67% of young people say they want a socialist economic system. On climate change, the housing crisis and nationalisation of key industries, the youth of today see capitalism as an evil and socialism as a good. I am delighted to be joined by author of this research paper, Dr Christian Nemitz, Head of Political Economy at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Um, So first of all, uh, can you talk us through the findings uh, of the report? Um, Who was polled and what uh, positions uh, do young people have on the issues of the day? Sure. Um, So over the past couple of years, we've seen the emergence of various anti-capitalist mass movements, uh, which are in the main youth movements, such as Extinction Rebellion, Black Lives Matter, Momentum, of course, uh, those are probably the most uh, famous ones. And we wanted to know to what extent the worldviews or the, the, the policy positions of those movements are shared by young people, because uh, it's, it's easy to go along with uh, a media hype and just um, extrapolate from the most visible movements to entire generations. Uh, it's, it's, uh, there's a bit of a media hype uh, around this that, that every time one of those protests, one, a left-wing protest breaks out that uh, this gets uh, generalized and uh, presented as the voice of a, of a generation. But it's also easy to do the exact opposite and just dismiss it all as uh, a noisy minority when the reality is we don't really know uh, how um, how how widely the ideas of, uh, of movements, left-wing movements like that are shared and that was what, what the poll was for. And uh, so we uh, put various positions, various anti-capitalist cliches, you could say, that uh, people involved in those movements would usually express uh, to our respondents and uh, statements such as uh, that capitalism is to blame for climate change or that capitalism fuels racism and and, or, uh, or that capitalism makes society more selfish, greedy, materialistic, all these usual anti-capitalist cliches. And it turns out that uh, you always get approval rates of, um, of between 70 and 80 percent of the people polled uh, always accru- uh, express agreement with those statements. In this case, we polled people age between their late teens and mid 30s. But I'm also um, integrating that into a wider review of previous surveys on on, uh, similar subjects, where they look at a broader age spectrum and um, where it turns out this isn't uh, a phenomenon of of just the youngest. This is, uh, yes, young people, but in the very broadest sense, young and early middle age. So those are the people uh, polled and the age groups that we were interested in. And uh, yeah, it does. It turns out that the this uh, popular cliche of the woke socialist millennial that is broadly correct. It's not just a cliche. It is, uh, but also it is a reality. That's uh, the those are the positions endorsed by the vast majority of people in that age group. Um, many people who see uh, the findings of this poll will simply say, you know, tell me something new, because it's, it's been assumed for some time that young people are more left wing. But what is more concerning about this research is that you suggest that the belief um, that, you know, they'll grow out of it, you know, is no longer the case. Um, can you explain why that is? Sure. Um, yeah, there are two things, uh, at least, that I would say are new about this. The first one is that you're right. We've known for for a long time that young people tend to be more left wing than the general population. There's nothing new about that. But until a couple of years ago, 
left-wing didn't automatically mean anti-capitalists. Left-wing could mean somebody who wanted a more regulated form of capitalism or somebody who wanted capitalism with a more extensive welfare state, things like that. That was um, what, what was considered left-wing. Over the past few years, we've seen the emergence of an explicitly socialist left-wing that uh, Six, seven years ago, if, if you had told me I'm left-wing, I would not have assumed that you want to abolish capitalism altogether. I would have assumed that you, you're somebody who wants a, a more coordinated form of capitalism, some, um, some, some different version of capitalism. Uh, but I would not have started from the presumption that, that you're against capitalism per se. In fact, quite, it was uh, quite a common statement of, uh, of, of left-wingers to say, I'm not against capitalism, but that was the most uh, the conventional phrase uh, to to characterize left wing positions. And since then, we've seen the emergence of a very explicitly anti capitalist left. Uh, of course, there is still the type of left that made its peace with the market economy, uh, the social democratic left. Those people haven't disappeared; they're still around. It's just they're very much on the defensive on their own side and uh, they are the ones who feel that they have to justify uh, their broad support for capitalism of some sort and uh, that, that that nowadays if, if somebody uh, if you tell if you tell me that somebody is left-wing I would assume that that probably means anti-capitalist uh, it's it's become much more normal uh, perhaps the default uh, position on the left to be against capitalism per se and to be in favor of some often quite ill-defined uh, socialist alternative. And that's what we find in this study as well, that, that we have this uh, question, uh, do you agree with the statement that socialism is a good idea, it's just been badly done in the past? And uh, we have 75%, three out of four people, agreeing with this. And uh, this isn't the first survey which comes to this conclusion. There have been similar uh, surveys which, um, where the numbers were lower. In our case, the numbers are, are higher on this, uh, but that's because previous uh, similar surveys had a don't know response option. So uh, what, what happens then, most people are of course not hugely political if you're faced with a maybe a, a broad brush sweeping statement of that sort and you're not really sure, you just tick don't know. We took that option away because I had the suspicion uh, that there were surveys that, that I've seen where you had about 40% in roughly the same age group uh, saying, uh, yes, I'm pro-socialism. You had around 20% saying, no, uh, I think socialism is a bad idea. And uh, the, the rest t simply take don't know. And uh, I just wanted to know what happens if you take that option away. If these people had to make a uh, decision either way, which way would they go? And this has produced a decisive result. Uh, if you take the don't know option away, then uh, socialism it is. And uh, the, the second thing I said that, that is uh, new about this is that, um, yeah, as I've alluded to, when, when we say young people lean left uh, lean towards socialism. Uh, I don't mean young people in the sense of people who have just left school. I'm not just talking about teenagers here. Uh, in, in fact, the, the vast majority of the, of the people polled are not teenagers. I'm talking about uh, people until well into early middle age. And uh, I think that is what's often misunderstood by people on what you could broadly call the pro-market side, meaning uh, classical liberals, conservatives, but perhaps also uh, moderate center-left social democrats, people who are in favor of a market economy of some sort. Uh, what those people often get wrong is when, when they see results like that, they say, ah, well, that's just young people. Young people uh, go through these phases and they, they grow out of it. That's perfectly fine if you're talking about a 16-year-old in a Che Guevara t-shirt. But if somebody is uh, in their mid-30s or, or early 40s, you can't use that language of uh, they're going through a phase or they'll grow out of it. Um, 
this would all be perfectly fine if we had lots of socialist 20 year olds but very few socialist 30 year olds then you could say yes give them 10 years uh, but if somebody is uh, is already in their early 40s and, uh, and and you still get very high levels of, of approval for socialist ideas in that age group which we do then it's just not there's no reason to believe that in 10 years time 20 years time 30 years time these people will think any differently uh, i think this is just a permanent effect that is something which will stay with those cohorts and i can see no reason to believe uh, that, that that they will automatically grow out of this i mean you, you sort of alluded it uh, to it before um i mean although the poll shows that people have an affinity with socialist positions uh when participants were presented with an opposing pro-capitalist sentiment uh, the research shows net approval for that argument as well so you know does that mean that young pe people maybe aren't fully educated about the difference between the two economic systems um, or are young people just um, succumbing to sort of group think you know this, do they believe that this is just the right way to think it's, it's right to choose socialism over capitalism because well look at all my friends sort of yes yeah that's that's the most plausible explanation it's not uh that the country is full of uh, of committed marxist leninists who have read das kapital from cover to cover and uh, you can see this from the fact that we get very conflicting contradictory results uh, you get, as you said, you, you get very large majorities approving of anti-capitalist, pro-socialist positions, but then you get, uh, you sometimes get majorities for pro-capitalist positions as well, with differences in degree, uh, and and often for statements that are close to being mutually exclusive or or at least very strongly in conflict with one another. So so this is a bit as if you had a survey where. Um, 70, 80 percent told you they want Britain to be outside of the EU, but you also then had uh, 50 percent or more telling you they want Britain to be in the EU, where you can't have it both ways and where it's clear that at least a sizable minority here uh, must be um, endorsing conflicting statements at the same time, apparently without realizing the contradictions. Exactly why they do that? We don't know. Um, the trouble is that this, this is uh, this is a quantitative research. This is just a large scale survey. This is not a focus group interview. If it had been a, a smaller group, if it had been a qualitative research, research, then of course I would have followed up. Uh, I would have asked, uh, hang on, you've just said this, now you say that. Don't you realize that you're contradicting yourself? And in this case, we couldn't do that. I haven't met any of those people. Uh, but yes, the most plausible interpretation of contradictions of that sort is just that um, people, a lot of people picked a position that sounds most familiar to them. Mm -hmm. And that would be the pro-socialist, anti-capitalist position. So you could compare this to, sometimes you get these surveys about the popularity of politicians, uh, which produce weird results sometimes. And that is probably because a lot of respondents just pick the names they are most familiar with. So therefore you had phenomena, a phenomenon like uh, that Theresa May had very high approval ratings in the, uh, in the early months when she became prime minister. And I think that's simply because a lot of people recognized her name. And so, yeah, this is the name I, I recognize. So I'll, I'll pick that one. And uh, then it suddenly dropped like a stone, uh, her popularity ratings. And I, I think this was, uh, there's there's not much of a contradiction here it's more that she was never truly popular but her name had a very high level of recognition it was brand recognition and mm. people pick the option that sounds most familiar to them so you could uh, therefore say okay uh, this this is quite a shallow commitment to socialism that we that we see here it's uh, these ideas are widespread but thinly spread that's where I, I put it in the report and that's uh, that that's that's all true but i'd say it nonetheless matters um it nonetheless tells us something that so many people pick those responses whether it's a firm commitment or whether it's just because it sounds familiar 
it still shows you these are the ideas that uh, are at least most widely known and that seem intuitively most familiar to uh, people in those age groups. And uh, for people on our side of the argument, that's still bad news. If you have up to 80% who uh, instinctively pick an anti-capitalist option, even if it's not very strongly felt, even if it's not uh, that, 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 that they could give you a, a, a well-articulated uh, justification, uh, a good reason why they pick that option, even if it's if it's quite a knee-jerk response, it is still there. It is a choice that they make, and it it tells us something. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's interesting because I mean, there is still further studies you can do on this, you know, to find out why um, you know people choose these options. Um, what what do you uh, what does this mean um, for capitalists um, or supporters of the market economy? Well, however you want to phrase it, it, it arguably this is a wake-up call um, of the enormity of the support for socialism amongst young people. And you've already talked about it, you know, well, it's, it's widespread, but it's very thin. Um, you know, what, what does that mean? What is the next step? Yes, uh, I, I think people who are broadly pro-market, pro-capitalist um, have forgotten how to make basic fundamental case uh, for capitalism to to explain the uh, the the strength of a capitalist economy at a fundamental level because for such a long time there was no need to do that there was an assumption that more or less everybody uh, or at least the vast majority of, of people accept the case for a market economy of some sort and that uh, most of the arguments that we have are about variations within that spectrum uh, between different types of capitalism and 10 years ago that that was true if you wanted uh, to debate with somebody who uh, wanted to get rid of capitalism altogether you would have to go to some um, Marxist student society or something or uh, to the, the Socialist Workers Party uh, it, it was but it was not something that you would do on a mainstream uh, political TV program, for example. And therefore, when this uh, explicitly socialist uh, movement came up, when, when there was uh, quite clearly a return of, uh, of socialism as a mainstream ideology, I noticed that a lot of people on, on our side of the argument just didn't know how to react to that. Because for so long, they didn't have to to do that it's a bit as if imagine we suddenly had a large movement which uh, demanded the abolition of democracy which said uh, let's bring back an absolute monarchy or something uh, I could imagine that a lot of people on the pro-democracy side would be very bad at responding to that because they, they just wouldn't know how to they, they uh, the whole time they've just assumed uh, everyone is sort of a Democrat so you don't have to justify that position mm -hmm. and uh, it is a bit like that you always with with capitalists there were of course always anti-capitalists there were always best-selling authors like Naomi Klein uh, but un until quite recently they w would not uh, advocate a specific alternative so it was always quite easy for people on the pro market side to say yeah okay but, but look at all the alternatives to capitalism look at where where that got us uh, challenging capitalism at this fundamental level is a dead end and and that was that 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 was all you had to say it wasn't necessary for someone on our side of the argument to explain why alternatives to capitalism fail why uh, capitalism does deliver prosperity, how a capitalist economy does that and, and what features it has which, which enable it to do that and why you can't replicate those features in a different economic system. That's something which um, we just forgot how to do because it, it was like a, like a completely undertrained muscle. It was like uh, going back to the gym for the first time after lockdown and, and realizing, oh God, I'm starting from zero again here. <laughs> and it was a bit like that when, when you had this resurgence of socialism uh, that a lot of people on the pro-market side noticed that that uh, defense of capitalism muscle had 
become uh, completely lame and useless because they hadn't used it for so long. So we, we, we need to get back to the basics, really. We, we need to re familiarize ourselves with the bread and butter arguments, the sort of arguments that the founders of this of, uh, of this institute would, would have f found very easy uh, because they were um, arguing about uh, economic policy ideas at a time when, when there were plenty of actual socialists in the country and then and they had to make the case for a market economy not just against someone who um, who was somewhat to the left of them or somewhat more interventionist than they were, but also against people who questioned capitalism altogether at, at a much more fundamental level. Mm -hmm. And those were familiar familiar debates in, in the 60s, 70s, up well until, in, uh, until well into the 80s. Uh, but then it was after the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, this, it was this seemed pretty much settled. And uh, we need to relearn that and refight the old battles. That's really interesting because, I mean, arguably we are seeing a sort of paradigm shift in in politics and, and do you not think it's quite difficult now and these ideas are becoming much more wise, widespread because the free marketeers, if we can call them that, are um, struggling to find a home at the moment, especially in like UK politics. Um, you know, it, like you're saying, it, this is a battle that has to be fought, um, you know, across the traditional um, two-party divide. Um, but I mean, some, some of the reaction to the paper on social media um, has uh, you know, it was quite supportive of the, you know, the finding that young people support socialism. And a common argument uh, I've seen is that, you know, young, the young people are look, uh, locked out of home ownership, they're paying sky high rents. Um, they feel they've been sold a dream, you know, by higher education. Um, they don't have jobs they want. So it seems on, on the face of it, like capitalism has failed them. Um, what do you say to that? Is you know, is that is that true, or are we are we in a situation now where you know what we're living under isn't actual capitalism? It's chronic capitalism. It's it's a mix between between the two. It certainly is. Although I would be a, a bit wary of of going too far down that road because then at some point you start sounding like a like a socialist who says ah oh, but that's that's not real socialism uh, i don't want to do the uh, the mirror image of that and and say uh, what we have isn't isn't real capitalism or real capitalism uh, has has never been tried but what i would simply say is that uh, in, if we look at the the sectors uh, where most of the discontent comes from, especially the housing market, of course, the housing sector. Uh, this is uh, a sector where Britain is very much the outlier. It's not that we have housing affordability crises across the world or um, or across uh, comparable countries. It's mostly a British thing and certain regions in, in other countries, so of course, uh, places like uh, California. Uh, but it's not a a general across the board phenomenon across market economies. Uh, there are plenty of market economies where house prices and rents um, haven't increased very much over the, the over the decades, uh, or certainly um, not m not much more than than incomes, and, and therefore uh, the 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 uh, affordability situation has not gotten any worse. It's Britain, which is the outlier here. And uh, that should in itself should tell you that this really is something uh, that over which this, this is a policy failure, something over which policymakers have full control, something which they could do very differently if they wanted to. And uh, that this is nothing which is inherent in capitalism, because if it were inherent in capitalism, we would have to see the same phenomenon in more or less all capitalist economies. Uh, the pattern you would then expect would be that you see this pretty, that you would see this pretty much across the board, except in places that mo that have only state housing or predominantly state housing. But that is not what we observe. It's uh, it's actually the opposite. It is, as I said, Britain is the outlier on housing costs. Um, if if you compare. Britain uh, to say the OECD average or the European average uh, or any realistic uh, comparison group, it's always Britain which is the outlier on, on housing costs. 
And uh, it's not that other economies don't have market-provided housing. It's not that they, own, that they only have council housing or, or social housing. Quite the opposite. Britain still has a fairly high level of, uh, of public housing provision or, or so social housing, certainly. Um, much more than most of, uh, of continental Europe, for example. And uh, that shows you that this, this cannot be a feature of capitalism if we only see it in, in one country. And if, we, if the situation is so much better in places uh, where the state is actually less involved in housing. So therefore, when, when I'm saying this isn't a failure of, uh, of capitalism, um, this is nothing like saying uh, real capitalism has never been tried or real uh, capitalist uh, housing markets haven't been tried. I'm saying it has been tried in plenty of places, just not here. Mm -hmm. That is the massive difference uh, between uh, a socialist who would uh, dismiss the failures of socialism by saying, oh, well, not real socialism. Uh, whereas when I talk about the problems that we see in Britain, I can point towards specific places uh, that are also market economies and that don't have that problem. And that uh, makes it crystal clear uh, that, that I'm not comparing the status quo to some utopia, um, some, some libertarian utopia, which, which uh, may only exist in my imagination. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying it is. Uh, there are plenty of good real-world examples um, of functioning housing markets. And, and in fact, that's, that's the norm. And a uh, housing affordability crisis, is the, uh, that is the outlier. That is the exception. And uh, therefore, I just don't accept the idea that uh, that this anti-capitalist backlash is justified by 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 failings of capitalism. And um, I mean, do you think we'll ever return to a situation um, like in the 1980s, you know, where young people were em embraced and were enthused by free market ideas like they were under Ronald Reagan? Um, you know, I mean, we, we have touched on it, um, but, you know, can people be convinced of free market ideas? Is it is it do it do do um, proponents of the free market have to change the way they sell um, the, the market economy? You know, focusing on consumers and homeowners and, and, and you know, spin it in a way like that, as opposed to maybe focusing on business and uh, and stuff like that. Is, is it a, is it a, a linguistic thing? Um. Well, it would, uh, young people embracing capitalism in the way uh, that, that happened in the 80s would require a 180 degree U-turn. Uh, I, I can't see that happening in the, in the foreseeable future. But I could imagine taking the, the, the wind out of the sails of the socialists. Uh, what you would have to do is uh, supporters of the market economy would have to become uh much more aggressively pro house building pro housing development that that really is uh the, the thing that drives a lot of this this comes up in the survey as well that uh, you have almost 80 percent of people in that age group um attributing high housing costs to capitalism they see that as a failure of capitalism and then generalize and they, they think oh this is what capitalism is like it means uh, i'm getting ripped off all the time so we, you would have to have the people on the pro market side would have to become very aggressively pro house building, pro liberalization, pro expanding supply, and um, that's easy for us as classical liberals. We already do that. We have been quite consistent on this uh, for for years, uh, but unfortunately, the people on the pro market side broadly defined, very few of them are classical liberals. We are the minority uh, on, on, uh, even on that side of the argument. Most, uh, most of the people who you would broadly describe as, as pro-market are conservatives, uh, at least in a small c sense, and uh, conservatism is very much wedded, at least in Britain, to nimbyism. Um, they side with homeowners, people who bought their homes at a time when, when it was still easily affordable. Um, people who bought it before the great house price explosion or in the early stages of it. Uh, it's, it's a relatively recent phenomenon, only started really in the mid 90s. And uh, people who bought houses before then or, or, or around that time, the early stages, uh, benefited massively. 
and the housing crisis that we see now is mainly a result of of uh, those people who are already there who already uh, who have already made their pile um, protecting those gains by blocking house building in their vicinities what happens is uh, that, uh, that that when you get um, applications for development or, or even just a, a pre-application some somebody um, raising that prospect as a proposal that uh, you get vocal homeowner groups trying to shut that down and they usually get their way because they're the the benefits uh, to them of not having any house building in their area are quite concentrated uh, it's quite easy to identify the beneficiaries of uh, of of blocking house building which is the people who uh, who live in that area and who already have a house and who, mm -hmm. who think that their house house value would come down if somebody else built. Uh, so these people are quite easy to organize, whereas the, the beneficiaries of house building, well, you don't know who those people are until right. the houses are built and they've been sold. You can't identify those people and therefore they're not a constituency that you can mobilize. And uh, supporters of the market economy would really have to switch sides here, stop uh, siding w always with the homeowners and the NIMBYs and side with the, the private renters, uh, the people on social housing waiting lists, the people who maybe still involuntarily live with their parents uh, or who involuntarily have to share flats even though they prefer to live alone. Those are the, the people that uh, that you have to side with and if you're on the pro-market side. They have to be your natural constituency and you have to um, signal to them, not just in rhetoric but also in uh, in, in actual policy, that you are on their side. That would be that. That's a way in which I could imagine that this could be turned around. It's a bit of a generational thing here. Intergenerational problem is quite ironic, really. You know, you're trying to attract young people to the capitalist side, you're then going to have to let down some older pensioners, and it's a bit of a, a, a catch twenty two. Um, but of, I mean, some people listening to that um, will be, you know. Mm, will probably be quite worried because many people listening will be homeowners and probably don't want developments in their backyard. Um, you know, so, you know, it, surely there has to be, you know, a, a, a line. And, you know, where do you draw that line at? On that issue, I would be um, quite uh, quite radical and, and against compromising with, with uh, homeowners. I would, if this were up to me, I would really uh, tell these people, look, you've had your way for uh, for, for nearly three decades. Uh, we've, we've had suppressed house building rates since uh, God knows when. Um, you people have had an easy ride. Uh, sorry, we're, we're not doing this anymore. Uh, enjoy your, your, nice, your nice houses. Um, good for you. But uh, we're now also we're now changing policies in in a way that um, that also benefits people who got there a bit later than than you did, uh, because this uh, this explosion in housing wealth uh, wasn't the result of of some people being especially entrepreneurial, having some great business idea. If people get rich in that way, that that's that's uh, totally fine for me. But. Uh, a lot of the housing wealth comes from people just being there a bit earlier. Uh, the, the, uh, the reason why millennials or Zoomers even more so uh, didn't have uh, the the opportunity to, to buy a house uh, in time is not that they lacked the foresight. It's just that the house price explosion, as as it started in the mid nineties, and uh, that means that no millennial, or well, maybe the very, very earliest millennial, uh, and, and even then only if they were in a, in a very uh, fortunate position, were in a, uh, able to make use of that. Uh, people benefited from the house price explosion simply because they got there a bit earlier. And that's also the way in which NIMBYs uh, cement their position and, uh, and pull up the drawbridge. Uh, it's simply because they are already there. They can show up at some town hall meeting uh, and, um, and, and, and block any development proposals they don't like. Whereas the people who would benefit uh, from new housing if it were built can't 
can't be identified until it, the housing is already there and those people can already move in. Mm. Then you could say in hindsight, okay, they are now also part of the community, so therefore it's wrong to say the community doesn't want housing. Yeah, maybe the community as it is now, but I'm more interested in the community as it would be if we had plenty of house building. And because surely if you've just moved into a newly built house, you're not going to say, oh, but actually I would uh, prefer uh, to live in a world where the house I, in which I live now had never been built. Um, surely then you are b almost by definition pro-development. And, and uh, that's why the idea that being anti-housing is democracy in action uh, is, is just a fundamentally dishonest way of uh, of of arguing so therefore um, no that as far as i'm concerned no compromise with nimbys whatsoever well i mean i'm, I'm hoping people listening to this will you know might have open you know change their views a bit because it is you know some people probably don't realize you know um, how you know young people uh, can benefit from housing reform um, but thank you to Dr. Christian Nemitz, Head of Political Economy at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Thank you for listening. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to the IA podcast on Podbean, Spotify or Apple. We also upload our podcast on our YouTube channel, IA London. If you want to help contribute to the IA's digital output, Please support us on Patreon, where you can benefit from exclusive membership perks whilst helping us continue to produce stimulating educational output. To become an online patron, click the link in the show notes.